say we're live. Yes, thanks, Stephanie. Go ahead. Hi, everyone. My name is Stephanie Aniel. I'm a social worker in adult services at Epilepsy Toronto. Welcome to our webinar about women and epilepsy. We have two incredible speakers today, Garcia Paul and Dr. Paula Marquez, who will be speaking on a range of concerns or topics specific to women who have epilepsy. I'll tell you a little bit about each of our speakers. Darcia Paul is a nurse practitioner at Toronto Western Hospital in the Division of Neurosurgery. She specializes in functional neurosurgery, epilepsy surgery, and neuromodulation for management of chronic pain, Parkinson's disease, dystonia, and epilepsy. Darcia will be starting a nurse practitioner-led VNS clinic at Toronto Western Hospital. She's also an adjunct lecturer at, the, at U of T. Dr. Pa Paula Marquez is an adult neurologist who has finished her neurology and epilepsy training in Brazil. She is currently a fellow of the Epilepsy Genetics Program from the University of Toronto based at Toronto Western Hospital. And her research has focused on better understanding how genes play a role in epilepsy. Paula also participates in surgical assessment for epilepsy patients, as well as two specialized clinics, one for women with epilepsy and the ketogenic diet clinic, all at Toronto Western Hospital. Uh, Darcia and Paula will each be delivering a presentation and then we'll have some time for questions at the end, um, though you can submit them throughout the presentation in the comment section. Just a note about questions, please keep them general, um, exclude any personal information because this is a public forum. Um, and, and like I said, we will take all questions at the end of the presentation. And with that, I will leave it to Darcia to take it away for the first portion of the webinar. Thank you very much. I'm just going to... So thank you very much, Epilepsy Toronto. I'm very happy to be here. I think this is a great opportunity and a topic that's very near and dear to my heart in terms of women with epilepsy. As Stephanie kindly said, my name is Darcia Paul. I'm a nurse practitioner at Toronto Western Hospital, Division of Neurosurgery. Um, I work for the Crumble Neuroscience Program. I do hold adjunct lectureship for U of T, Faculty of Nursing at the University of Toronto. I have no disclosures uh, for today's talk. However, I would mention that any recommendations or suggestions made throughout today's presentation in terms of management and treatment of certain types of epilepsy should be followed through by your primary care provider or your epileptologist to ensure that this treatment or course of action is right for you. There will be some objectives that I'm going through. I'll talk about the epidemiology of epilepsy. I'll talk about puberty, catamenial epilepsy, considerations for women of childbearing age. I'll discuss menopause as well as bone health. And I'll just have a quick summary of today's PowerPoint slides. So let's talk about the epidemiology. We know that by virtue, epidemiology makes reference to incidents and prevalence pertaining to epilepsy. There is an overall prevalence of epilepsy within the society. One can say that approximately five to 10 cases per 1,000 persons. If we further quantify this, it's about 1% of the population that has a working diagnosis of epilepsy. I should also make mention about 10% of people will have seizures in their lifetime. By definition, epilepsy is two unprovoked seizures greater than 24 hours apart. Some patients may present with a symptomatic seizure, but not necessarily holding the diagnosis of epilepsy. If we look to the chart at the right, it's a pie chart that really highlights possible etiologies of epilepsy. One could have an underlying diagnosis of infection that may result in epilepsy, that's about 2%. We can look further at trauma, about 5%, that may be a resultant factor of epilepsy. But I wanna draw your attention to the, pie, uh, to the left of the pie chart, which is the biggest part. 65.5% of patients present with an idiopathic diagnosis, meaning that the causation for their epilepsy is unknown. Clinically, they still present with seizures, evidenced by uh, EEG changes, their MRI may be normal, but we do know that we actually don't have an underlying reason of such. Regardless of the cause, treatment still is priority. So when we further look at the epidemiology, it's fair to say that epilepsy affects everyone across the lifespan. If you look at the chart here to the left, you can see that at age zero, newborn, we see the highest in early childhood. This is likely 
secondary to childhood epilepsies that are uh, particular to newborns, for example, infantile spasms that usually occur between onset of birth up until 12 months that may peak at four to eight months. Furthermore, it drops in early adulthood, usually peaks around puberty here and then may drop usually because the diagnosis is confirmed at this time and medications are typically uh, sort of in place and patients tend to be well controlled, but you can see as we go into the early 20s, 20s and 30 decades of life that things pick up. And this is likely secondary to possible trauma, fear, lack of fear at that time, increased chances of accidents occurring. And then we see the rise usually around after 55, going into the fifth and sixth decade of life. And this is typically secondary to increased risk of catching any underlying comorbidities, such as stroke or any vascular malformations that may occur that increases one's risk of developing epilepsy. Let's talk about puberty. By definition, we know that puberty is just a change. It's a transition from childhood into adulthood. We know that it's a marking of one developing certain characteristics that really is a coming of age for many people. There are many characteristics that young people do demonstrate that allow us to know that they're entering the phase of puberty. This is evidenced by the following. Sexual development, maturity of skeletal height. So oftentimes, you know, you have a child or you have a patient and you're like, wow, they've really grown overnight. It's usually an indication that they're really entering to puberty, if not entered it already. Attainment of secondary sexual uh, character, uh, sorry, attainment of secondary sexual development. So such things as facial features um, may be more prominent as well as hair distribution that's changed. Hormonal changes, particularly could be said along um, amongst young women. This is usually the onset of menses uh, fluctuations in terms of their estrogen and progesterone levels that cause, as we very commonly know, PMS symptoms. And in summary, we know that it's a transitional period between childhood and adult development. So what does this mean? Let's take a little bit of a deeper look at this. We know that puberty is a common time for epilepsy to start or worsen in young females. This is largely secondary to the hormones and other influences. We know that at the onset of puberty results in a fluctuation between progesterone and estrogen. And we'll talk about this a little bit uh, further in detail, but what's important to know is that sometimes this could be an underlying factor as to why that there's a ramp up or that there's worsening seizures in and around this time. It's also important to note that some epilepsy syndromes may remit, so they may stop during the onset of puberty. So these are usually typical, typically childhood onset uh, epileptic syndromes, like infantile spasms. And conversely, at the onset of puberty, we may see an occurrence of some seizure disorders, like juvenile myoclonic epilepsy. It's also important as healthcare providers that we look at the onset of which puberty uh, starts. We're all aware of precocious puberty. This is described and defined as the onset of puberty that occurs before the age eight. And if we look more keenly at this, we can hone in on certain diagnoses that may be relevant to precocious puberty. Frequency and severity of epilepsies are influenced by many factors internally. We can make reference to hormones. And when we talk about environmental factors, it, sorry, it could be in the context of their psychosocial environment, uh, their support or lack thereof, to name a few. At the end of the day, we know that the treatment for most epilepsies is to start off with medications. And I think it's important as we talk about women with epilepsy that there are some increased long-term risks associated with antiepileptic medications and that we're very mindful in terms of our decision-making process when it comes to choosing antiepileptic medications for our young female patients. In short, what can be said is that they're inversely related. Seizures alter hormone levels and hormones alter seizure thresholds. What I mean by that is that, for example, if someone is going through their menses, typically there's a rise in progesterone at certain points 
uh, in their cycle, and that may lower their, th their seizure threshold. We know that seizures are an electrical problem within the brain, and it results in neuronal excitability. As such, with an increase of progesterone, it could decrease the threshold. Conversely, if a patient is admitted or presents to the hospital, we're able to draw certain blood works, such as prolactin, that's commonly found in women. It's a, it's a hormone that is you, typically, some people may make reference to it that helps with milk production. It's one of the female hormones that is usually elevated after, the, after presentation of a complex partial seizure and or a generalized tonic-clonic seizure. Let's deep, dig, a deep, dig a little further and talk about catamenial epilepsy. We know that it's doubling of seizures in and around menses. So patients may perceive that they're having a doubling of their seizures or worsening of their seizures around menses, but really the gold standard at this point is to really calculate and write it down in your diary. Am I having more seizures around this time? If so, what days? Is it a couple days before? Because the most common pattern for catamenial epilepsy is typically before and during the menses. There are many factors that contribute to catamenial epilepsy, and I'm gonna dig a, a little further into this. As you can see at the bottom here, we know that estrogen is a proconvulsant and progesterone is an anticonvulsant. What that essentially means is that too much estrogen can increase one's chance of having more seizures. Conversely, more progesterone can do quite the opposite. As clinicians, we look at studies. Studies provide us with evidence base. They allow us to make decisions to help guide our, our, our decision-making process when we see you in clinic. This was a study completed by Herzog in 2008, and it really looked at catamenial epilepsy at length. What you see here is a diagram. This is a diagram. This is an average cycle of a woman's menses. And the average cycle that they rounded was every 28 days. So if we look at the every 28 day cycle, <clears throat> essentially what this diagram does, does demonstrate that, pre, that, menstrual, that the menstrual cycle is broken down into different phases. If we're gonna keep it for simplicity, we can break it down into menstruation, premenstruation, menstruation, and then your ovulation period. Typically what happens during the menstruation is that there is a rise in your estrogen levels. As such, women that are highly sensitive in terms of their hormonal fluctuations may result in worsening seizures. That's why at times patients may have an increase in their seizures before the onset of their menses and the first couple of days going into their menses. When patients enter the ovulation stage, naturally what happens is that your body will have a decrease in estrogen and rise in progesterone, which is protective against seizures. For some patients that don't enter into ovulation, you may find that throughout the course of their uh, menstrual cycle, they continue to have ongoing seizures. What does this mean and what's the treatment? Please note that the treatments are not specific or limited to what I have on the next slide, but these are some common strategies that we use in order to manage catamenial epilepsy. Patients may or remain on antiepileptic medications during, um, sorry, indefinitely or in and around their menses. There are some non-hormonal therapies that may help in terms of uh, catamenial epilepsy, particularly benzodiazepines such as frisium or the other name here is clobazam, or diuretics such as diamox or acetazolamide. These are usually used as what we call pulse doses. So they're typically taken a couple of days before your menses when uh, the documented rise and seizures occur and the first couple of days during your menses and you may stop thereafter to try to combat the, uh, the increase in seizures that occur during your menstruation. Additionally, when we talk about uh, medications, it's, it's often common that we talk about uh, oral contraceptive medications, the use of continuous oral contraceptive pills to avoid cyclic variation. So essentially what that means is that if a patient is on the oral birth control pill, there's usually uh, seven days in which they take sugar pills and those are, the, those are usually the days that patients menstruate. As such, it would be recommended that patients don't take that break and they continue on to the next uh, package of uh, oral contraceptive pills 
to avoid fluctuations in the hormones. There's many considerations that we bear in mind when we're talking to women of childbearing age, particularly with the diagnosis of epilepsy. So let's talk about it. We know that choosing the correct AED is of utmost importance because we know that there's a lot of long-term associated side effects uh, regarding this as well. If the plan is to have children in the future, there are many teratogenic side effects that could be associated with the medication. As such, long-term medication is always suggested to be taken with folic acid. There have been studies to suggest that long-term use of anti-epileptic medications can deplete one store of folic acid. Therefore, uh, a dose between two to four milligrams or sometimes five milligrams is suggested during the course of taking these medications. Always want baseline drug levels, particularly as a woman um, is considering pregnancy. Pregnancy should always be planned uh, if it can be with epilepsy because depending on the, the medication, it may affect uh, the pregnancy. And also it's important to note that pregnancy may make seizures worse. It could actually make seizures better or there could be no change. So patients need to be closely monitored. Prenatal vitamins, Birth control pills are often discussed, particularly at a young age. We do know that certain medications, depending on the medications you are on, may affect the efficacy of the birth control pill. The gold rule standard is the IUD intrauterine device because we know evidence has suggested that there's minimal interaction between the IUD and um, most of the antiepileptic medications that our patients take. We know that epilepsy just doesn't affect uh, uh, just doesn't affect the brain, but it's a whole, it's a, it's one that affects many parts of the body. And as such, appropriate referrals are often thought of. For our women that are seen at Toronto Western Hospital, they're all, they're all largely referred to high-risk OBs, given the context that they're pregnant and they have epilepsy. We work closely with our community partners, such as Toronto, Epilepsy Toronto, uh, to help with many of the psychosocial issues that accompany epilepsy. We have a social worker within our program, and that of course, tapping into our social support systems. We make, we make referrals to genetic counseling, particularly uh, if we feel that there's a linkage between genetics and the onset of your presentation. And this becomes particularly important for patients that are considering pregnancy. Psychosocial concerns, there's much evidence and we know it's strongly linked that epilepsy has a strong underlying uh, flavor for patients to have anxiety and depression. So we know that this comes hand in hand and it's of, of utmost importance that we manage all factors because we can manage epilepsy, but if the anxiety and depression is not managed, we know that it's often a trigger. And as such, bone health is quite important as well because of long-term use of these medications. As we go into menopause, we know, as we talked before, puberty is the onset of menses and menopause is coming down to the ending. So menopause occurs when the ovarian follicles are depleted, resulting in a fluctuation of estrogen levels. So just like during your, during your menstrual cycle, there is a surge of estrogen. At times, this may occur during um, a menopause and particularly in the perimenopausal stage. Just like pregnancy, there's fluctuations in, seizure, in seizures. Uh, the, same could be, uh, the same could be correlated with menopause. About 40% of women report worsening seizures during menopause, 27% report improvement, and 33% report no change. At the end of the day, I think there's a close linkage between catamenial epilepsy and the, ten and the tendency or the likeliness of one to have worsening seizures during their uh, <clears throat> menopausal uh, periods. So knowing that we take extra precautions to ensure that uh, these are managed accordingly. You may be familiar with the HRT, the hormone replacement therapy. This is common uh, therapy associated with poor management of menopause, but it's important to note that with HRT is usually a rise in estrogen, particularly exogenous, so oral estrogen that patients take may worsen seizures. So although it's helping with the menopausal symptoms, it can make epilepsy worse. So I think that's important information to be mindful of, particularly if you're entering that stage. With long-term use of uh, medications, we do know that bone health becomes quite important. Studies have shown that 
Prolonged use of antiepileptic medications increases one's risk of fractures, osteoporosis, as well as osteomalacia. As such, uh, we are prudent to ensure that we send our patients for periodic DEXA scan, which is essentially a bone scan because of the added or additional risks dependent on the antiepileptic medication of choice. We know that some medications <clears throat> are increases or accelerates bone loss more compared to others. As such, we always encourage a well-balanced diet, weight-bearing activities, as well as consideration for other medications such as calcium and vitamin D to help with um, deterring or expediating uh, bone, bone health. I think the important thing to know is that there are other factors aside from prolonged use of antiepileptic medications, such factors as smoking, ethnicity, um, to name a few that may uh, be contributing factors towards um, osteoporosis or osteomalacia. In summary, uh, it's, it's important to know that overall 1% of the population has a diagnosis of epilepsy. And oftentimes this can be described as a very silent um, syndrome. Some patients may only experience at certain times of day, but it, whatever it is, it's still very impactful in one's quality of life. I think it's important that when we're talking about women with epilepsy, that we manage it from a, a holistic approach, whether you're actually a woman or a man, but we know that epilepsy is very multi-layered. We can fix the seizures, but at the same token, we know that there's other underlying issues that may be present. And as such, the best care would be one to address all issues. Causes of epilepsy could be multifactorial. Additionally, we know that there's many triggers for epilepsy, lack of sleep, increased stress, uh, all, too much alcohol. These are all discussions that are had. And I think it's very important uh, when you go into the office that it's discussed uh, during, during your clinic visit. As women, we go through hormonal influences and changes. We know we people experience PMS, premenopausal, uh, perimen uh, perimenstrual uh, symptoms prior to the onset of their uh, of their menses, as well as perimenopausal symptoms. And with the fluctuation of estrogen and progesterone, we do know that it could affect uh, one seizure burden. As such, I think it's very important that these are always always discussed with epileptologist, reporting it. Underreporting it is never a good thing because we want to ensure that you get the maximal care and benefit to your health. Some important links that I just want to show, and I think uh, members from Epilepsy Toronto will share these links for you. But the top link is just uh, a link that describes teens and epilepsy, and it really gives a good a scenario of discussions to be had. I think what's important to note, particularly as women enter into puberty, that their friends become very important. And with that becomes expectations uh, compounded by feeling embarrassed. So it talks about many discussions that at times may be hard to talk to your, to your children about, whether it's dating, driving, sexual encounters, changes within the body. Additionally, the link below the North American Pregnancy Registry, uh, this is something that we have to talk about in clinic. Uh, this is a link for patients that are pregnant. We are able to find out about the medications uh, based on women that have graciously signed up for this link. It allows us to track the medications that you're on and follow you through your pregnancy to ensure that there's no untoward side effects to you or the baby. It's a free link and it just allows us to do, um, allows us to collect data rather uh, to ensure that we're able to give you the most up-to-date information pertaining to the medications. I'd like to thank you. I'd like to thank Epilepsy Toronto for this opportunity to speak today. Please see my credentials at the bottom. I'm very happy to answer any questions uh, after uh, Paula gives her talk and, and then moving forward. My references are here. Thanks so much, Darcia. That was great. Um, we're going to scoot right along to uh, Paula's presentation. And I'm just reminding everyone that um, please type your questions in as we go along, um, but we'll answer all. We'll have a question period after um, this next presentation.
So I'm going to continue talking um, just within the same uh, theme of women in epilepsy. So um, again, I would like to thank uh, Epilepsy Toronto for this opportunity to be here um, exploring this theme. Um, as Stephanie has said, uh, I'm a neurologist and I'm currently working in the epilepsy genetics program as a fellow. So I'm going to continue talking and explore a little bit more about pregnancy and breastfeeding and how epilepsy and anti-epileptic drugs can affect these two phases. So um, I'm going to start by saying that um, the good news is that most women with epilepsy, they will have a normal pregnancy and delivery without a change in their seizure frequency. Uh, however, this woman, they should have a special attention by both medical and obstetric teams because there might be some complications, which include not only seizures during pregnancy and delivery, but there might be some effects on the, the baby. There we, it's important to discuss. So our current practice, as Darcia was saying, is that uh, women should enter pregnancy having a complete seizure control and planning the pregnancy, or at least having as few seizures as possible. But we know that sometimes that, that is not the case, unfortunately. Um, it is important then to review the need for continuing antiepileptic drug before entering pregnancy, if that is possible. In some cases, women will have only focal seizures, and if they're not wishing to drive, they may be willing to reduce or even stop their antiepileptic uh, therapy before getting pregnant. Uh, however, we also have to keep in mind that in not, in not all cases, we are able to decrease or even uh, stop medication before pregnancy because there are some types of epilepsy that are more difficult to control, and also they have a higher risk of recurrence, even if the seizures are well controlled. And an example here would, would be a juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, which is a pretty common type of epilepsy. So as I said, it is very important to discuss the teratogenic risks of certain antiepileptic drugs and put these risks into perspective. And by teratogenic risks, I mean uh, the risks that are related to the antiepileptic drugs um, when it comes to the development of the baby. So these risks, they will vary depending on the type and the association of medications. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that. Uh, but most of the malformations, they will develop in the earlier stages of pregnancy. That is why it is important to, to um, plan the pregnancy when that is possible. Because a lot of the times when women discover that they are pregnant, uh, the, the critical period of development uh, for the baby is already uh, gone. So this is just a, a slide showing uh, the overall risks for some of these antiepileptic medications. So uh, the one that we fear the most in terms of risk is valproic acid. The risk can be as high as 13%, but that will be in the case of high dosages and when it is associated with other antiepileptic medications. And there's also a few others that warrant a special um, a special treatment, which are phenobarbital, topiramate, and phenytoin. So these are the ones that are, um, are more concerning, but that doesn't mean that is not possible to have a baby taking this medication. It just needs more counseling and understanding uh, these risks if that is the case. And then we have some newer medications that are, um, they, also pose a, a higher risk than for the general population, but they are overall safer. And those drugs are lamotrigine, levetiracetam, carbamazepine, zonazimide, um, clonazepam, gabapentin as well. So for some of the newest drugs in the market, unfortunately, we still don't have enough data uh, on how these medications might affect the babies. 
so these new medications here, azlicarbazepine, bivaracetin, clobazin, glucosamide, and perampanel, unfortunately, uh, we don't have uh, this information. Some of them seem uh, to be quite safe, but we um, don't know that for sure. So that's why, again, I'm just gonna reinforce what Darcia already said, uh, that if a woman becomes pregnant and has epilepsy, we would encourage uh, to be in touch with this uh, North American registry, which is an, an initiative by Harvard Medical School. And you can actually call them and they will get back to you um, and, and they can follow you up through your pregnancy. And they will not only help you throughout your pregnancy if you have epilepsy, but also other women and uh, in the future, maybe understand the risks uh, related to some of these medications that are newer in the market. So I'm just gonna show some of the most common uh, teratogenic effects of some of these antiepileptic drugs. Uh, just keep in mind that um, there are other types of um, teratogenic um, risks and a lot of them, they are they can be corrected somehow by surgery. I don't have enough time to go through details of all of these. I just wanted to show what are the most common ones. So uh, cleft palate and lip, which is a split in the lips and in the roof of the mouth. Um, microcephaly can also happen, which is when the head has a smaller size and uh, the brain as well. Uh, there can also be developmental delay, which is when a child uh, will be delayed in acquiring certain uh, motor skills or language skills. So for example, in this um, uh, picture, um, the child will have some difficulty sustaining the head or even sustaining uh, the body. Other things, uh, other effects can be dysmorphic features. So uh, there are many. This is just an, uh, some examples. So the face can look uh, a bit different. Uh, the space between the eyes can be different. The flat nasal bridge can be, uh, the nasal bridge can be flat and there can be some differences uh, in the distance between uh, toes and in the creases in the, the hands. Neural tube defects, which is when um, parts of the central nervous system, which include the brain and the spine, they are not well formed. Intellectual disability. And in some cases with valproic acid, there can be even a, a lower in the IQ as, as uh, much as 10 points. But really, when there is higher dosages and uh, association with other medications, there's also risk of autism for some of these medication and some uh, cardiac defects that might include uh, communication between the two sides of the heart. So we just have to keep in mind that that's, again, that's very individual. So there's no uh, clear number for one medication or one individual. So it's always uh, balancing the risks. So for valproic acid, uh, as I said, it depends on the dose and if it is combined with other antiepileptic medications. For the other antiepileptics, also if they are on higher dosages, the risks, they will increase. And if there is a prior pregnancy or a family history of a fetal malformation, that also uh, increases the risk of having a baby with uh, malformation. So uh, it's, it is, as I said, it's a balance. Uh, it's very hard uh, sometimes to um, know exactly um, what's going to be the outcome of, of a pregnancy. So we have to discuss these risks and, and, and put them into perspective uh, because even though uh, these antiepileptics, they pose a risk for the baby uh, in terms of developmental delay and congenital malformations, we have to keep in mind that seizures also can cause maternal and fetal distress. So we don't want women to enter their pregnancy having lots of seizures because that, that is a, a high risk uh, for her and the baby as well. 
So again, here, uh, it is very important to uh, be counseled before pregnancy if possible, plan as much as possible. As Darcy has, has already said, folic acid for women in childbearing age. Uh, we try to, to uh, keep the antiepileptic drugs in monotherapy, which, mean, which means one drug at the lowest uh, possible dose. But as I said, in not, in not all cases that is possible. And if that is not possible, that doesn't mean the pregnancy is going to have a, uh, that you're gonna have a baby with some sort of malformation and that it's not possible to be pregnant and have a healthy baby. So it just has to be put into perspective. Um, and also establish um, pre-pregnancy, what, uh, what are good levels of medication and how they can uh, help controlling the seizures because the best predictor we have that seizures are going to be well controlled during pregnancy is, it, is if seizures are well controlled nine months before um, a woman enters pregnancy. So if she's well for in the nine months before, most likely she's going to continue well during pregnancy. So what will happen to the seizures during pregnancy so this is a large study that uh, gives us a, a, a good idea of what can happen. This study was conducted with 2,000 uh, women that became pregnant with epilepsy. And uh, in approximately half the cases, the seizures did not change to the frequency they were before uh, pregnancy. In about a quarter, they decreased. And in about a quarter, they increased. So that, that gives us an idea. So why can they increase during pregnancy? So sometimes uh, the antiepileptic medications are um, inappropriately redu reduced, or they can be even a deliberate or poor antiepileptic drug adherence. Sometimes women are so afraid of the effects the antiepileptic drugs can have on their babies that they might even stop medication when they uh, find out they're pregnant, which is something we highly do not recommend. There should always be counseling from a healthcare uh, professional before making any of these changes because that could lead to increased seizures and therefore even more uh, damage to the baby. Uh, there can also be uh, falls in the concentration of these antiepileptic drugs. Some of them, they decrease during pregnancy because of the uh, amount of body weight that a woman will gain during pregnancy. There's also hormonal changes. There can be vomiting at the beginning of pregnancy. And also there are additional stressors such as emotional stress and sleep deprivation that can act as triggers uh, during pregnancy. And the highest risk, it's actually uh, in the 24 hour uh, postpartum period and during labor and delivery because there are additional stressors during that time there's also hyperventilation and pain, and that can all trigger an uh, increase in seizures, and they can happen in two, uh, two to four percent of women with epilepsy during this, uh, this stage. But we can also help reducing seizures during that time. During labor, it is very important to continue antiepileptic drug therapy. We sometimes may even increase it a little bit or even give something uh, that will help not only controlling seizures, but the anxiety related to that time, like clobazam. Uh, and it, it's also appropriate to give, uh, to offer epidural anesthesia early during labor to alleviate some degree of pain, emotional stress, and also exhaustion. So we really don't want women to ask for an epidural when they are in the, this red stage here, when they are uh, feeling the worst pain possible. So we want them to uh, have a lower threshold when um, asking for an epidural to avoid uh, triggering seizures. Um, and also we can help monitoring the baby. So even though uh, neonates of women taking antiepileptic drugs, they can be smaller. Um, there is no increased risk of perinatal death. And we can also help by offering uh, routine antenatal fetal tasks, such as the ultrasound and the, the cardiac fetal ultrasound as well. 
Um, it is important that delivery uh, takes place in an obstetric unit where we have resources uh, for the baby and the mom in case something happens. And um, a lot of women, they also ask if there's an indication for a C-section. And actually it is uh, only indicated for the usual obstetric indications or in case the seizures are um, uncontrolled uh, late in pregnancy and there are generalized convulsions. So in that case, we also would uh, recommend a C-section. Otherwise, women can have a normal delivery. So in the postpartum phase, uh, it is important to keep a healthy diet, keep tracking your seizures, uh, try to keep a seizure diary. You can even have this, uh, use an app on the phone to track your seizures. Uh, again, medication compliance is the most important thing here. Um, and the levels, uh, the dosage after pregnancy, they might be higher than pre-pregnancy because of the additional stressors uh, during that phase. And it is important to try to avoid uh, stressors that may trigger seizures like sleep deprivation, stress, try to rest as, as much as possible, even though we know it's difficult having a newborn baby, try to meal plan uh, and anything that could uh, help in that sense. And uh, something else that I would like to discuss briefly is about breastfeeding. A lot of women think they are not, um, they should not breastfeed because of the antiepileptic drugs. And actually uh, most of these medications, they have a very low concentration uh, in the breast milk. So we usually encourage breastfeeding. Uh, and what we uh, usually do is just observe the baby for drowsiness. But most of the times um, it will go well and women can breastfeed um, as long as they can. Also some safety measures that I'm gonna briefly talk about. So always carry personal information, medical information, and ideally a cell phone at all times with emergency contact numbers. Also have a system to call for help. Uh, that can be pagers, alert systems. There are even new devices. They're, they're help alerting someone if a person falls, like uh, those new watches that might help in that sense. Uh, try to give a house key to a close friend or a family member in case of an emergency happens. And parents with frequent seizures should also speak with the local first responders about their needs and seizure response. And here's just some uh, general ideas for women who might be entering uh, pregnancy in the postpartum. So try to organize as much as you can. Organize baby items on all levels to minimize climbing stairs. Try to change the baby on the floor so in case you have a seizure, the baby will be safe. Uh, keep rooms free of clutter and avoid objects that could lead to fall like rugs. Um, try to remove or pad objects with sharp edges so you avoid accidents. Also, safe, uh, use safety locks on cupboards, cover electrical outlets, and remove dangerous objects. If you're breastfeeding, try to, to uh, breastfeed when sitting on a couch, uh, on a padded floor, or in the middle of the bed. Also, even consider using a stroller inside the house, and whenever go, going for a walk, uh, try to be a company. Uh, when, when bathing your baby, you should have someone around and try to use a baby-sized bathtub instead of using a big bathtub with a minimal amount of water. Also use safety gates on stairs and between rooms uh, for when the baby starts crawling. And when you want to have your baby on a safe environment to play, you can use play pens or enclosed play areas. You can always um, teach your older children even to help you in case you have a seizure. And there's been lots of reports of older children that help their mothers in that uh, sense. And also uh, keep your medication out of reach of children and in childproof bottles. And lastly, um, as Darcia has already said, uh, remember the social support systems that you have, like your family and your friends, also community networks, social workers, and then that's where Plexitrono might also be able to help you. And uh, with that, I'll just finish my talk here. Thank you very much.
Okay, thank you um, so much to both of you. Uh, those were great, great presentations, lots of uh, valuable information. Um, we do have a few questions, uh, a question from Facebook and a few questions that clients sent me in advance of, of this presentation. Um, so, so I'll just shoot and whomever, whichever one of you thinks is most appropriate to answer the question, then please, um, please go ahead. Um, would you advise a woman planning to get pregnant to go off of her medication for the first trimester to avoid the effects of the AED on the development of the fetus then resume at the beginning of the second trimester? So maybe I can, uh, sure. That. You can answer, yeah. <laughs> All right, so um, as I said, it, it's hardly recommended to stop medication when you find out that you're pregnant. First thing to do is contact your doctor to assess what is the best option. Most of the cases we're not able to stop if you're already uh, pregnant. We might be able to reduce or change your medication, but it all has to be um, evaluated and in conjunct with your doctor, but definitely do not stop your medication um, once you find out you're pregnant if you are not able to plan ahead. I just also like to add on too is that we're always afraid of risks. So if you stop your medications and you have worsening generalized convulsions, say for example, we're always concerned of you injuring yourself and that risk of injury could be risk to the fetus as well. So just to echo what Paula said, I agree. I would highly recommend that you don't stop uh, sort of cold turkey and advise the physician. Typically starting medications while pregnant are safe. We do have studies to suggest certain medications are a lot more safer compared to others. And as Paula said, if it's a planned pregnancy, we're able to sort of walk you and guide you through it to ensure that the chances of these uh, tetrado teratogenic effects are less or not present at all. Okay, great, thank you. Um, okay, so a question from Facebook. Uh, do you recommend vitamin B12 injections postnatal to curtail depression? Okay. So, um, Unless there is a deficiency in vitamin B12, I don't think there is a uh, recommended, um, that is not recommended for all women, but vitamin B12 might play a role. So it is important to um, supplement vitamins and usually start supplementing them even before pregnancy and we continue them throughout um, breastfeeding and after that. And if there is a need uh, to supplement more vitamin B12, then an injection can be uh, used in that sense. Anything to add to that, Darcia? No, I agree. I agree. Okay, okay. Um, okay, so another question about folic acid. The recommendations for folic acid uh, for women with epilepsy ranges from two milligrams to five milligrams daily. What are the factors that should be determined um, by a woman and her doctor when considering the daily dosage? I think if a woman's pregnant, usually the, there's been studies to suggest that five milligrams would be most important. But additionally, there have been some studies that come out saying that uh, if you're not pregnant, that five milligrams is not necessarily warranted during that time. So sometimes it becomes sort of um, physician preference. So I know at Toronto Western Hospital, usually the recommendation is five milligrams once a day while you're on antiepileptic medications. Uh, but I've seen it as low as, as two for patients that are not pregnant. And when they become pregnant, then we increase it to five. So it's really patient geared. And okay. uh, I, I would also I'd like to add that also depends on the type of antiepileptic medication you're taking. So valproic acid, for example, depletes more uh, the, the, the folic acid. So we usually recommend five, but for some antiepileptics, uh, we might recommend a lower dosage. Okay, okay, perfect, thank you. Um, okay, another question. Uh, thank you for encouraging breastfeeding, but do you have advice on how to do this safely? Um, I have been through breastfeeding with seizures and would recommend getting as much sleep and help as possible. So, so I guess the question is, do you have any advice on how to breastfeed safely? 
I think Paula went through some safety, but I think the main thing is we're always concerned that when, particularly in the postpartum period and when you have baby in your hand, there's always risk of seizures. So I think when it comes to breastfeeding, as Paula mentioned, we highly recommend it. Uh, but at the same token, I think patients would be best suited if they're low, lower to the ground. So if they're breastfeeding, sort of sitting on the floor with pillows around them, in the unlikely event that they have a seizure, that there's not a large uh, time for the patient or the baby to fall to the ground. Additionally, if they have supports, then people should be around. I would eliminate you know, any sorts of like extreme amount of pillows around because if you're having a seizure and the baby and you sort of drop the baby and it's in, in a pillow, uh, that can cause other risks as well. Those are a couple of suggestions. Okay, Paula, anything to add to that? No, I think that, that pretty much covers it. Okay. You know, always, uh, um, as I showed too, uh, you can breastfeed in the middle of the bed if you feel comfortable with that. So those are some things that Okay. Always having someone around as much as you can. Um, okay, another question uh, from Facebook. How do you monitor the epilepsy medications during pregnancy? Um, so during pregnancy, what we usually do, we can have drug uh, levels. Um, so blood work done uh, every month to monitor the levels. Some medication there they're quite stable during pregnancy, but for some others like lamotrigine, for example, you might have to increase uh, as the pregnancy um, gets to its end. So that's why it is important to have your doctor um, seeing you as um, like on monthly visits to help you manage the antiepileptic medications and see how much you need to increase uh, during pregnancy. I agree. And I think it's also important too, prior to getting pregnancy, that's why I always plan, we always try to plan it, that it's good to know what the baseline is. So if a lady, if a patient's on Lamotrigen, it's good to have a baseline. So it's a starting factor to know, say for example, they were seizure free and their Lamotrigen level was at X amount. Then we know we can gear it uh, and wean them down to that amount postpartum stage. Okay, great. Um, okay, another question from Facebook. Um, is the depo shot a good form of birth control? I guess within the realm of for a person, for women, a woman with epilepsy. So <clears throat> depo vera, I mean, it's convenient in the sense that you get it once every three months, it's an injection, you sort of get it and forget it. The thing with depo vera, it does have a lot of, um, Side effects, like any other medication, patients can have uh, breakthrough bleeding, as well as it increases the chance or accelerates one's uh, um, likelihood of getting osteoporosis, osteomalacia. Um, so typically, I guess I, I don't usually counsel my patients to get Depovero. I don't think it's a complete contraindication. Um, Paula, I'm not sure what your experience is on that. I, I, I agree with you uh, with the risks of osteoporosis. Uh, sometimes it is preferred, um, like as you said, IUD is probably the safer uh, method. Um, but if that's not possible, that provera is an option and has uh, low interaction with antiepileptic medication. So in that sense, it's a good medication because it won't interact um, a lot, but just have to consider other risks. Right. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so another question. Uh, if increased estrogen creates a greater likelihood of seizures, what recommendations do you have for young women with seizures who choose to take oral, contraceptive, oral contraceptives? When it comes to oral contraception, so usually, as Paula just said, our gold standard is usually intrauterine device. Um, whether it's hormonal or not, we do know that there's little interaction between that and the medications, like the antiepileptic medications. Conversely, if they choose to take an oral contraceptive, we know that typically, if not sensitive, the amounts in the actual oral birth control are relatively lower compared to like pure uh, exogenous estrogen. With that said, I think that the conversation needs to be had with your healthcare provider because we do know that certain medications may break down the actual oral contraceptive and make it less effective, like enzyme inducers such as carbamazepine. Additionally, we do know that there's evidence to suggest that um, oral contraception can decrease 
some of the levels of the actual antiepileptic medication that you're taking, such as lamotrigine. So I think it's a very uh, individualized uh, question and one that should be discussed with your care provider because there's many factors to take into account when we talk about birth control. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, another question. Would the mom be encouraged to have follow-up baby developmental screening during the baby's first year? Yeah, so... Um... I think that's uh, the, what the pediatricians, uh, where they play a role here, because usually they can monitor the babies for their development and see them uh, in monthly visits at the beginning to, to assess how their development is uh, going. And if they find it's necessary, if they see there is a, a delay, they can uh, make a referral to a pediatric neurologist to follow up. But in most cases, as I said, uh, the pregnancy goes well and the babies are healthy. But I would say the pediatricians in that uh, sense would be the ones to uh, help assessing if there is any delay in development. Okay. Okay. And I think that's all we have for questions. Those were some really great questions mm -hmm. this afternoon. Um, and Yes, yes, that's it for questions. So, um, so thank you so much, uh, Paula and Darcia, for speaking today. Um, I was a really interesting presentation and thanks for answer, answering those questions. Thank you to everyone who uh, watched this, uh, this webinar. It will be up on our website within the next few days. Um, I do also just wanna mention that if you're living anywhere in Ontario uh, and you have epilepsy, um, or, you know, our family member or friend of someone that has epilepsy and you need support, please um, call 1-866-EPILEPSY to be connected to your local epilepsy agency. So that's 1-866-E-P-I-L-E-P-S-Y. Um, if you do want to be a part of Epilepsy Toronto's virtual Purple Walk, which is upcoming on July 11th, um, again, you can participate across Ontario. Um, because it is a virtual event this year, um, please visit our website at epilepsytoronto.org slash walk. We would love you to be a part of the team. Um, and with that, I'm going to end the, this webinar. Thanks again to our speakers, and I hope everyone has a great day. Thank you.